welcome to Women, Sweden and Women Black Lesbian Film Festival, sponsored by Zami Nobla, National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging, Out on Film, Sisters in Cinema, in partnership with Beyond Bold and Brave, Black Lesbians United, AARP Georgia, and Third World News Real. My name is Mary Ann Adams, founder and executive director of Zami Nobla. We are committed to building a base of power for Black Lesbians 40 plus, centering service, advocacy, and community-engaged research. You can check us out at www.zaminobla.org. I am honored to introduce this talk back at the edge of each other's battles, the vision of Audrey Lord with filmmaker, Dr. Jennifer Abbott and her conversation partner, Dr. Kendra N. Bryant. Dr. Jennifer Abbott was a radio broadcaster for 19 years. She hosted and produced news, features, live talk shows, documentaries and special programming on public and commercial radio in Connecticut, Philadelphia and Boston. She was the first woman in Connecticut to host a nightly AM radio talk show, The Jennifer Abbott Show. She is an American feminist, activist, and award-winning media producer. Abbott holds a PhD in intercultural media education and women's studies. As a feminist, activist, and professor, Abbott was part of the dawning of the second wave of feminism in the United States. Her conversation partner, Dr. Kendra N. Bryant, is currently serving as an assistant professor of English at North Carolina A&T State University, where she teaches contemporary grammar and rhetoric and advanced grammar and argumentation while serving as the department's composition director. In addition to being an English teacher, Brian is a poet and a painter. Her poem, We Be Theorizing, is published in the afterword to Deborah Plant's The Inside Light, a new critical essays on Zora Neale Hurston, new critical essays on Zora Neale Hurston, and her poem, Confessions, as well as her personal narrative, Gays Are Going to Hell, A Lesbian Teacher Tries to Teach Comp Compassion, appears in Stephanie Allen and Lauren Shirell's 2016 Solace, Writing, Refuge, and LGBT Women of Color. Additionally, Brown's artwork has been showcased at Tampa Bay's Boba Internet Cafe, FAMU's Foster Tanner Arts Gallery, and Atlanta's West End Performing Arts Center. We are thrilled to have two of Dr. Abbott's films in this year's film festival, The Passion and Pursuits of Angela Bowen, as well as The Edge of Each Other's Battles. This talk back is certain, certain to be illuminating and informative. Dr. Bryant, take it away. Thank you very, very much, Mary Ann. I appreciate the space that you always provide for us. And thank you, Jennifer, for providing film on two very important um, artists. And so um, I watched your film a couple of times, 2002's The Edge of Each Other's Battle, The Vision of Audre Lorde. Now I'm gonna provide this disclaimer before I, 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 I pose my questions. I am not a film director, producer or screenwriter. I don't profess to be an expert in these, nor do I consider myself an Audre Lorde scholar. As a matter of fact, as Socrates notes, all that I know is I know nothing at all. And so it is in that nothingness that I pose these questions. The first few of which will focus on your compositional choices and the remaining regarding Audre Lorde, okay? So you are an award-winning film director, writer and producer, having won the Women Over 50 Film Festival Best Documentary for the Passion and Pursuits of Angela Bowen, some preferred Cake Lesbian Film Festival's Best Documentary for Nice Chinese Girls Don't, a poetry memoir, and San Francisco Black Lesbian and Gay Film Festival's Second Choice Best Documentary, Canada's Real Out Queer Film and Video Festival's Audience Award, Berlin's Black International Cinema Best Documentary Production Award, to name a few for the edge of each other's battle. So my question is, why was it important to archive Audre Lorde and her vision 
12 years after the 1990 I Am Your Sister conference, which much of your documentary covers. Boy, I, I'm not talking about me. I mean, I did all that. Okay, all right, that's good. Thank you very much. All right. And then some. <laughs> okay, and then some, yeah. Well, you know, you know, when you're a political person and the purpose of whatever it is that you do is to try to make a difference in other people's lives and contribute to a movement. Um, you know, um, when, when it gets to awards and things like that, it, it, it helps other people to see the thing that you're trying to make, you know, which was the, whatever it did. Um, in 1990, when Angela Bowen, my partner, who's the picture in there behind me, right? She and Jackie Alexander, another professor, two black lesbians met at the International Nairobi Conference on Women. They met there and discovered that they both lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, lost each other's information, found each other on the streets of Cambridge. And when they did, they, that, that sisterhood, that coming together was amazing because the two of them did conferences that were world and internationally based. One for Simon and Coley, who was a black gay activist who went before the judge and trial was in jail at the time of uh, Nelson Mandela for being gay and also a black activist. They brought together an international group of people for Simon and Coley. And that was their first adventure together. And then they did the 1990 conference on which this film was based. Um, the Edge of Each Other's Battles of Vision of Audrey Lord. At the time, I had just started learning how to do video because I was in radio broadcasting for many, many years. And they were just teaching women and, and they were required <laughs> to teach women in the cable stations, teach people in the community how to use cameras and stuff like that. So I didn't have a lot of experience, but I was able to garner a crew <laughs> with whatever cameras we could gather and what other people could gather and not, you know, I didn't hire people. This was all free. We just, you know, I just coordinated it. I directed it. I had people told people what to do. Um, and, um, and Angela and Jackie did not want me to even have a camera in there. I had to have, I was crying and everything told Angela, I said, you've got to document this. This is historic. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. They were afraid that by having cameras in the conference, that it would really upset and disrupt what was going to be going on in the conference with Audrey Lord and all these people that were coming together to celebrate her life. And finally, because I, you know, my partner was Angela and she saw me crying on the floor and I never cry. Um, she went to Jackie and said, okay. And then Jackie said, okay, but I don't want them to do this, any cameras in the workshop because okay. that'll be really intimate. I said, fine. I didn't have any idea. I didn't want to do, there was no way I could have done that with the cameras I had anyway. So it was a form of documentation, but it took me a long time to, I carried those tapes with me from job to job to state to state <laughs> and until I could actually settle into some place to begin and get the skills that I needed and the money that I needed to raise to help me to edit that film. It took a long time. I got my, you know, I was working on my PhD. Angela was working on her master's degree. We had kids to raise. We had, you know, all kinds of stuff. Life intervened, but I was determined to make that film. And, um, so it was with, it, it took me a long time uh, to do that. And in the process of that, I was learning how to be a video producer because I was hired at Digital Equipment Corporation to be a corporate media producer because I knew how to do some video and some audio. And I learned a lot of skills at Digital Equipment Corporation and got support there as well. And so it was, a, it was you know, it, it, you, you, it, well, I wasn't formally trained in film. I wasn't formally trained in radio broadcasting. Not what too many women were, you know, I'm 74 years old. So this I'm talking about when I was much younger, you know? Right. So um, anyhow, um, the reason why I did the film obviously is for the, for the reason here. We, here we are, <laughs> you know, the conference was in 1990 and this is 2002 and I'm being interviewed on Women's Suite on Women Film Festival, which never would have taken place in 1990. And you're gonna be playing both of my films. So it's like, that's my reward. You know, that's my Academy Award. That's my Oscar, because that, that means that there's gonna be something, I would, Audrey Lord always said, you will be in rooms I will never be in. <laughs> yeah. As a white woman, as a Jew, my a every, you will be in rooms you will, I will never be in. And I took that very seriously. 
So it was, it was my responsibility and my honor, you know, to work with this material. And it just took me a long time to wrangle it all together because, you know, the quality was, eh, eh, you know, <laughs> you know, and then I was, you know, so anyhow, there's a lot, a lot I can say about making that film. So Audre Lorde says, find your work and do it. Did you know then when you were crying on the floor to bring those cameras in that you were doing your work? Yes, yes. I did. How, how, did you, how did you know? Like we, so those of us who have read about Audre Lorde, we do know that Audre Lorde was, was dying of cancer. She died two years later, having battled cancer for 12 years. Did you know that that conference would have been so important to yes. you. you did how yes, did you know well you know i had started out as a feminist in 1969 so it was before i met angela 10 years before i met angela i was already doing stuff you know i was a singer in the new haven women's liberation rock band you know i, I knew that whatever i started in radio because there weren't any women on radio you know i already knew that whatever we did it was better than nothing because nothing was there for us OK, so I knew how to take myself seriously in terms of whatever contribution I could make. I mean, I was in New Haven, Connecticut, Katie Warbeck and other people were working on abortion stuff at Yale University. You know, the first women had been entered into Yale University. You know, it was like whatever we did was better than what was there. So it didn't make any difference if it was bad or, or whatever. It was something. At least it was something. So I knew as a media person, I would already been a media person. I loved radio. I had been producing documentary and all that kind of stuff in radio. I knew that this was his, this was historic. I already had that responsibility as a media person. I, I was a broadcaster. I really was a pr producer. So I was just, even though I had new skills <laughs> and I wasn't that confident in my skills, I knew the importance of documenting it for the future. That was absolutely, you know, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a legacies of, of feminism, of lesbianism, of, of black activism, so much history we did not have when we started to do that movement in 1969. We certainly didn't learn about people, you know, you know, in school, you know, we were absent all that history and we were just digging it up ourselves, right? So I knew the importance of leaving a footprint, you know, that and, and making one, you know, even if the sand was gonna cover it all up, we had a chance, we had a responsibility to try to make that footprint in the sand. So I, I knew that. Right. So Audre Lorde talks about being afraid. Were you afraid? She talks about pushing through that fear. You're right. Anyway. You always said she, and Angela always said that she was, she was really not courageous. She always, right. that when Angela did her research. Um, I, I'm not sure that I was afraid. I just knew that I had to not be a control freak. I knew that I had to settle for what I was going to tell people what they were going to, I couldn't be in all those places at once. I had to give a crew some information. I had to tell them what I wanted and let them go because I could not be in all those places at once, but I could. So I just, I had to, like I said, I just kind of let, let, I had to trust myself enough to know that I knew enough to at least get something. Like I said, whatever it was, was going to be better than nothing. Right. So, so were you the one who did, were you behind the camera with the interviews? Oh, oh all the interviews that were done. I, I did, I had conducted all those in interviews. I mean, I had arranged for all those interviews. Like when the one that, the one that takes place with Jackie Alexander and Audre Lorde mm -hmm. and the one takes place between Barbara Smith and Audre Lorde. It was important for me. I knew as a white woman, I wasn't the one to be interviewing them. There had to be conversations between black women about whatever it was. So I arranged for that. I was behind the camera sometimes. I had arranged for people to be behind the camera if I could afford it and to pay for it. Um, um, I had a whole crew going out there with our little cameras and interviewing people in the conference because there was like all these, you know, 1200 people there. Right. So mm -hmm. I was I was, you know, I was making sure that things happened and that things got recorded. And sometimes I held my camera. I had my camera. I some of my my, my footage is in that camp in that film, too. Right. So we were all doing whatever we, we could do. We could get all that stuff. So I had but I still have originals of these boxes and boxes and boxes of, you know, tapes, <laughs> you know, wow. original tapes from all of this stuff. And that's what I had to. It was enormous, ginormous. 
So that means you got to meet Audrey Lord. You got to talk with Audrey Lord. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? What was what did it feel like being in that space in her space? I was so fucking intimidated. I was so nervous. Okay. So I have several of, you know, because I interviewed her for a radio. I did a radio profile of Audrey Lord that ran on public radio, WGBH, called a radio profile of Audrey Lord. Uh, Alice Walker is in in that um, uh, radio profile. Alice Walker, Adrian Rich is in there. Um, you know, um, it, 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 you know, it, it, it's a beautiful thing. I, I, I put it on my website, it, you know, so if you go to the website, you can hear the radio profile I did of Audrey Lord because I was working at public radio. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I was really, you know, but, and the reason why I know Audrey Lord, this is very important. I know Audrey Lord only because my partner was Angela Bowen. Okay. That's the only reason that I knew Audrey Lord is because Angela Bowen discovered Audrey Lord by herself looking at a black lesbian journal, little journal called Ashe. I think I pronounced mm-hmm. it correctly. Okay. And Audrey Lord appeared in there. And it was it was because she discovered Audrey Lord that she knew as a woman in her early 40s or late 30s, I don't know when quite like, when she discovered it, that she had the right to live her life as a black lesbian when before that she did not know that she had the right to be able to go out there and leave the life that she had created and establish the importance that she had in the black community. It was because she read Audre Lord and from that moment on she it was her mission. It was her mission to find out about Audre Lord. She went and met Audre Lord. Audre Lord gave her a card and a reading she was the only other black woman in that reading when Audrey Lord was there. And Audrey Lord said, if you ever need to call me, call me. And she never called Audrey Lord, but she had that card in her pocket and helped her to leave the life that she had established, but needed to leave, live the life that she wanted to live as a black lesbian and a feminist and to be part of the army for Audrey Lord. So I'm, I'm gonna jump around now on my questions. And so I have two, one is gonna be about Alice Walker, but I'm gonna hold that question to talk about um, Audre Lorde's visibility or lack thereof. And so uh, your partner discovered Audre Lorde, what was that, in the, in the 70s? What are we thinking? In the 70s, because I okay. think she was out there in 76, 77 or something like that. I didn't meet Angie until 1979. So she already okay. discovered Audre Lorde by herself in her room Late at night, after the kids were asleep, the husbands, was everything, you know, boom. Well, here we are, 2020. I teach at Historically Black College University, and I have grad students who have never heard of Audre Lorde. I um, am currently studying, again, in a women's and gender studies course at UNCG in their, in their uh, women's and genders program. And um, when women's and gender studies program, and Audre Lorde is often a footnote if mentioned at all, okay? I took a feminist theory course. Audre Lorde was a footnote in that class. And so my question really is regarding the availability of your film. Uh, I had no idea it existed except for Marianne and Zami Nobla, right? And then I perused your website and it is $5 to watch it on Vimeo, right? <laughs> but then to purchase a license, it's like $350 through that website. And I'm wondering, I mean, I don't know how much control or, or what, what does that look like for making this film more available to the masses? What does it look like for marketing it? Because while there is a, a Zami Nobla program in Atlanta, um, where is, where, is, where is our information on Audrey Lord on a larger scale when you, have a sister having discovered her in 79 and Audrey Lord still in that discoverable in 2020. 2021. I feel like, okay, did I wake up and miss, miss No, it's really 2021. Well, let me say this about that. The price of the, uh, uh, on Canopy and for university is that amount of money. In other words, university libraries, that's where women make movies and where, cause they, they get, they get a whole percent, a big percentage of whatever is sold. So that's a library cost for mm-hmm. a university to use for their libraries, for their classrooms. That's standard for university um, uh, purchases. The Vimeo is five bucks a piece or 4.95. So anybody could get it 
on Vimeo. It's all over the place. So it's, it's quite available. It's just when you show it to an audience, when you show it at a university, that's a different, um, that's a different category. And that's how women make movies helps me to make money. Right. Which is not much. I mean, right. I don't even make enough for like two months worth of groceries a year from what I make from my films. Okay. So, um, and, and, and it took me 12 years or whatever it is to make it. And I never paid myself to make, okay. So, you know, and Women Make Movies is, is, is a women's distribution company that's helping people like me. At least it's in a catalog someplace because mm -hmm. it's not gonna be, where, where else would I, where, you know, how else would I've gotten the word out? It's not and that's like my there concern. is a that's, that's my concern is how our um, black women's voices are still not loud, loud enough. And we are well, in, a, well, go ahead. I, I, you know, I think the question is, is that um, I, 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 you know, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, I don't think it's been um, adequately reviewed, um, the film, you know. Um, um, I, I don't know if it's because, I, I just don't know why. Uh, but, um, you know, it's a historic document. And it also, the thing about the film also is that it, it shows a period of time when people believed in coming together and before the word intersectional was created. Mm -hmm. And the vision of people coming together and Audrey for the first time was able to see her own vision come into play at that conference, which is in that film, when there was a, a disruption that people didn't feel as though that their voices were heard. The Asian women at the conference did not feel as though that they were being heard. So Jackie and Angela and a couple of other people came together to figure out, well, if they're not being heard, we're not, must be not doing something right at this conference. Mm -hmm. And then they turned the whole conference around at the end to make it inclusive. Because Audrey Lord said, you know, it's not our differences that keep us apart. It's how we deal with our differences. It's how to use our differences, you know, how to use our differences. And so the conference organizers had to use those differences in the, in, in, in the conference itself in order to deliver that theory in practice. And Audrey says in the film, it's the first time that she had ever seen her theory be in, used in practice. It was very powerful. So it's a very important historic document in the sense that there were many, many, many differences in that conference, but we all, all were drawn together by Audrey Lord now to actually get in and be responsible to each other and hear each other's stories through poetry, right? Um, right? And to dance with each other, right? And to hear each other in our distress and also in our joy and to really listen to each other under her big arms and her wings was so important and needs to be important, I think more now than ever before. There's so much separation between so many things, you know, to be a radical feminist at that time meant anti-racism, being aware of issues of class, issues of sexuality and homophobia, issues of anti-Semitism, of Native American rights and land. Being a radical feminist kept expanding. It wasn't a narrow definition. It meant that we had to keep growing in terms of our ability to expand our concept of who we are responsible to who we are responsible with, who we are responsible for, and how do we how do we do those things? Those were questions, and we came together, and it was a beginning. It was it was it was a beginning, and we were only grassroots. We had no money when we started. I mean, they put in like five dollars in the bank when they started. You know, so it I think it's a record of a vision before there was a name for it. You know, it was called. You know, it was just it was. It was a record of a vision that I still, and I want people today, young people to know that it's possible for people to work across their differences, you know, and to not be narrow-minded, not to have a kind of out of a narrow, a narrow protection, you know, that you, and, and Angela always said, you have to find your allies wherever you go. They could be any color, they could be any age, they could be any race, who are your allies? And she had plenty of allies, Angela did, had plenty of allies, and so did Audrey who were not black, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, who were not lesbian, mm -hmm. you know, 
or they they had they they found their allies and um, wh whoever showed up in the body that they showed up up in the color that they had uh, on their faces, you know, they found their allies and and were able to do enormous things. You know, there were about eighty five volunteers for that conference, and the majority of them were white. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a time when people were struggling with and accepting and knowing that they had to deep, dig deep into their own upbringing and their own blinders across many differences, not just one or two or three that were, we, we, had, a, we, had, a, we had a huge agenda because a lot was at risk, a lot was at stake. And, and you could hear Audrey speak to that how much was at stake and a lot is at stake now. And I just hope that people see the film more so that they can have a, a really understanding that this vision is not new. You know, this is not, this is not new to, 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 to the third wave or the second wave. It, it was an advancement of, you know, movements that had been, been laid down and worked on for so long that we're finding out much more about now than ever before the people and the movements and, 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 and the, and the sacrifices and, and the bravery and the courage of people so long ago before us. We're just discovering those names and fights and battles right now. This has to be part of it. I think this little thing that, that, that came out of this grassroots conference, I think it, it, it should be just talked about in the context of now, I believe. Okay, so I have a, have a couple of questions. I'm gonna try to stay focused. So I'm gonna go back to Alice Walker since you mentioned allies and we've been talking about feminism. Was uh, Audre Lorde and Alice Walker allies? And I'm thinking about the phrase or the theory of womanism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I am an Alice Walker fanatic. And I, I am often annoyed uh, by folks' omission of her theories regarding womanism, which responds to the black feminism and, and, or, or white feminism and black face that Audre Lorde says some women believe black feminism to be. Right. You know, Audre Lorde says black feminism is not white feminism and black face. And then I think, well, when are we going to embrace our, um, Alice Walker's womanist theory? And so do you know if at all about Audre Lorde's ideas about Alice Walker's efforts at womanist theory, which then invited the black lesbian and the black spiritualist, which Audre Lorde seemed to have been both of? Okay, here's, here's the deal. I don't know about Audre Lorde and womanism, but I do know about Angela Bowen and womanism. And Angela okay. had a lot of trouble with womanism and she wrote okay. many papers about it. Um, and it is part of her papers that are gonna be going to Spelman College. Okay. Um, uh, she, uh, I wish I had known that you were gonna ask that question because then I could be more articulate about her problems with it, but she found it problematic. Um, okay. and, um, and spoke about it. Um, so I, 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 can't, I, I can't speak intelligently about the uh, arguments that Angela had. I, I, I absolutely do not know uh, what the relationship is or was between Audrey and uh, uh, Angela uh, uh, and uh, Alice. Alice Walker's womanism. I just know that Angela was never anybody to be afraid to challenge things uh, from within because she had her own compass. So I, I, adv I, I invite people to, um, to look at the material that we're gonna be putting up at Spelman College. Um, and if you want to, I'll be happy to share some of those papers with you. Very much so. Excellent on womanism. So you can see what her arguments were. Um, and how they hold up for today. I mean, as, as a scholar uh, of womanism, I think it would be you know, um, important for you to see another scholar's view on the subject who was clearly a black woman and feminist and a lesbian. So that would be exciting to me if I could share those materials with you to understand that, but I'm not the scholar on that subject. Okay, I receive it, I receive it and, and I look forward to it. Um, and so my other question, uh, I was thinking about this question as you were using the terms Audre Lorde's vision and her theory. And there's a part in the documentary where um, Calvin Hurton is talking about the terms ideology, theory, philosophy. And so he was saying that to study Audre Lorde would be to study philosophy. And I was wondering, why didn't you name your film the philosophy of Audre Lorde versus the vision? 
Oh, uh, well, maybe because I'm not that esoteric or a scholar. <laughs> no, you know, I don't want to get that all flighty, flighty. Do I really know what philosophy is? Um, so I think I think that the, it was the reason why it was vision. I think it is because um, it helped me with the vision. It helped me to expand my own vision of of that 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 she and Angela shared that vision, you know, this broad international vision of, uh, you know, this, 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 this coalition, this, this, this recognition of difference, this, 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 this use of, 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 of grassroots and community, you know, and across race and inclusive of race and across class and inclusive, all of those things, you can't, they had that vision together. So it was a vision of Audre Lorde that was shared by the women who helped to form that conference, both Jackie Alexander and Alan, Angela Bowen. And that has influenced me. I mean, you know, I was raised in a fairly narrow construct. I'm Jewish. So certainly I was aware of, uh, you know, my people being turned into lampshades, you know, and I mean, that was something that I grew up with. Um, and, you know, so I, I understood that, but, but that didn't mean that I had a race and anti-racist perspective because there was racism within my family. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I grew up with a lot of narrowness. You know, I grew up with a narrowness about class. I had a lot of work to do on myself. And it was Audre Lorde and Angela Bowen who lived the philosophy. They lived the philosophy and they had a vision. So right. I, I think that's why I did it, but I love the question. Okay, and so I'm gonna ask you a, a, another question, similar to uh, the idea of being esoteric. Uh, Audre Lorde was talking about MLA when talking with Barbara uh, Smith, right? And MLA being the Modern Language Association, which is still pretty hard to toddy, right? Um, I was surprised to hear that Audre Lorde was part of the Black Arts Movement. Oh, and my first question was where? Where, where is she in the black arts movement that seems to be dominated by voices with of Amiri Baraka and Nikki Giovanni? Was Audre Lorde more esoteric than she realized? She was a lesbian. Mm, Nikki might be. I really don't have to go any further than that. You know. Um, the respectability politics got in the way. It was really, homophobia was really, really rampant. And um, um, I'm trying to think of the poet with all the braids. I'm, I'm Sonia Sanchez? Yes. Even Sonia reckon, you know, realized you know, her homophobia during those, those years. Um, and this is something also that Angela um, wrote about, you know? Um, and, you know, she, she didn't treat, she admitted that she didn't do well with mm. her. In that in that realm, it was a very narrow um, construct about sexuality that it didn't count. That feminism was not something that was part of the fight. It was a nationalistic perspective. It was male, and Beverly Guy Sheftel talks about this in the film. Um, and uh, it it was just a very so to to go outside of that means that she. And you know, in my in my, in my film about Angela, when she goes on, you know, um, um, the black show, um, um, I can't remember the one that's on the, the black show. I can't remember it's on the. Anyhow, she talks about the the the, the narrator uh, moderator asks, uh, "What's it like to have rel black religious organizations um, uh, be homophobic?" You think that black religious organizations are more homophobic than other other places and she said it's, it's and what her answer was I'm, I'm screwing this up but her answer basically was um there's so much stuff so much stuff that happens to black people in this world and to have your own people you know um to disregard you to hate you to exclude you is even more painful and she okay. said that on national television mm -hmm. Okay, so you can imagine for Audrey experiencing that kind of being an out, out, outsider. I mean, that was what she was. She was a sister outsider. Where do you think she got that title from? She was a sister and she was an outsider for the very reason that you're saying that within the black arts movement, who was recognized, right. <laughs> who's legitimate. Right. 
And I, and I still think that, that there's work to be done. You know, Cheryl Clark, Jewel Gomez, all these black lesbians and feminists who are definitely part of a black arts movement. Where does that definition get expanded? How does that get inclusive? How does that get recognized and, um, you know, and acknowledged? Uh, so there's, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, you know, it's starting to open up, obviously, but reluctantly, NAACP even, you know. So, um, you know, we're talking about a time period when gender and sexuality was really not seen as part of the struggle, both politically right. and artistically. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm still, so, so now I'm, I'm about to move to this next question, <laughs> which I know some people will be like, what the hell, Kendra? But I, I have to, I have to ask it because I'm, I'm being honest with myself. Um, you provide viewers clips of several poets who performed at the I Am Your Sister conference, and rightly so, because Laura considered herself a poet and believed, as noted in her 1977, poetry is not a luxury. It is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are, until the poem, nameless and formless, about to be birthed but already felt. However, I felt a way when the first poem was a calling out, uh, almost a lambasting of Miami's Two Live Crew in Compton's uh, NWA, an acronym for niggas with attitudes. I'm born in Miami in 1979, the same year Arthur McDuffie, the black motorist, was murdered by my Miami-Dade police and they were acquitted, thus leading to the 1980 Miami riots. So I cringe at this thought of censoring and or silencing black male rappers who often speak out against social injustices. And so I, I do understand the conundrum we find ourselves in when black men objectify and commodify black women, but there's just an itch I can't scratch regarding the viewer's invitation to the poetry readings beginning with a poem deriding black male rappers. And so I wanted to know what was your intentions, if any, with including that particular poem first? Well, I think, I, I think that I chose that poem because it was so, she was crying and scared and shaking as she was telling you that poem. Okay. She was. So she knew because there were men in that audience. This was not an all women's audience. This was a woman of men, women, and young people as well. Um, so her daring to speak out about the sexism, about the pain of being, of having violent language to a sister. Who was saying that at the time? Who was even talking about that at the time? So she was hurt. She was scared to say it. She was having to talk out about her brothers, but she had to because she had been violated herself. She was a sexual abuse victim. She wasn't telling anybody to not love the rappers or like the rappers. She was telling them, I'm here, look at me. Look who you're talking about. She was trying to, she wished, I wish that that could have been a poem that they could have heard. Mm -hmm. Instead, it was a conference of 1,200 people who were progressives. Maybe it affected some of the young men that were in that audience or the young women that were in that audience. I don't know, but I thought it was incredibly brave of her because to deal with differences within the people and the families that you love and depend on and to be hurt and battered and violated by people that you're supposed to be part of is a very scary thing to say. It's a very hard thing to say. She wasn't a known public po poet. She was mm -hmm. not only nervous about that, she was not a published poet. And she came from the community in Roxbury and she knew Angela. Mm -hmm. And it was a very difficult thing for her to do, a brave thing for her to do. And it helped, I think, as a media person in radio and somebody who was in part of the New Haven Women's Liberation Rock Band, I already had an analysis about the Rolling Stones and every other male rock band that really messed with women. You know, you're under my thumb, you know, where you belong is in the bed, 
you know, all of that stuff. I was very sensitive to the kind of sexism that was allowed and women were dancing to their own degradation at that time with absolutely no analysis of song lyrics and how it felt to dance to your own degradation. So she was making us aware. I thought it was educating. Um, so I have a very different take on, on it than you did. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate what you're saying, but those were, I, I hope I've made, you know, told you reasons why I thought it was so powerful because, you know, it was in an audience, remember, that at least 50% of that audience was black and people of color. It was the largest conference of its kind to have that happen. So she wasn't, it wasn't that she was talking to a group of white people, she was talking to her people mm -hmm. <laughs> that were coming from the community of, you know, both class-wise, race-wise, whatever-wise. And there were a lot of young people there. So that's why I chose it. Yeah, and I, you, and you did answer my question. I appreciate it, and I'm 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 so challenged as someone who believes in freedom now, freedom of all people, but then can sing to pop that coochie. Hey, you know, I, I feel both sides. Um, but I've also read Ernest Gaines and Alice Walker and Bell Hooks, who, who have talked about the trauma that Black men experience and how they are sub, some often um, unconscious of what they're doing, right? And while they degrade women. They also speak to police brutality and some of the other societal ills. So I'm always stuck in this matrix, if you will, of trying to figure out how to navigate through those, you know, through loving hip hop and rap and gangster rap and all that hood shit um, and, and, and loving gospel, except to know that I'm a whole person, right? And I guess, you know, when I heard that be the first poem, I thought, oh God, why? Why was this the first one? But I do understand your response. Um, I, I received also, it. Uh, let me, let me say too, if you listen to the rest of the poems um, that are delivered, um, where they talk about police brutality. And classism. In other words, mm -hmm. a, it, it, it's not a lack of representation. It's just another voice within right. that conversation. Right. And, that, and, she, and, her, you know, and that was on an unacceptable voice. Whereas right. talking about police brutality, is acceptable. And right. so, you know, it was all about that kind of rubbing and speaking and not allowing the silences to keep us silent. And those silences can be fucking deadly, excuse my expression. Right, right. No, you're right. And it is, it is the rubbing. And it reminds me of Audre Lorde's uses of erotica, where um, you have to have these challenges and it's almost in those violent spaces that we can find peace, that we can find an answer. Um, an answer to what seems unanswerable. Or, right? or and, and if there are no answers, you keep talking. Right. You know, because like she did not have a position on like, you know, um, uh, s and Audrey didn't. Okay. Okay. I mean, she, she didn't, right? So there were, we don't have all the answers. And there were a lot of people during that time period who were into lesbians, like, you know, who were into leather or whatever that other stuff was. And it was like, you know, they were the enemy. It wasn't a conversation. <laughs> it was just like, they're the enemy. So, and, that, and, and, and if anybody were to ask me, what would you do differently? Or what would you tell people now about movement building that you learned from when you were in a movement? I would just say that we cut off each other with our differences and it makes us fucking weaker. Well, well so then, do you see that happening within the Black Lives Matter movement? These oh, that's not for me to say. Okay. I am not in, I am a, 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 part, a, a, a supporter. I am a cheerer from behind, right? Um, but um, I don't know those insides. I don't know what those questions are. I just put it out there to say, wherever that is happening, it, it's a question, it, it, it's important. It's certainly happening within lesbian trans stuff, not all trans stuff, but people who are criticizing that make the word of like radical feminists or radical lesbian feminists a bad word um, because, um, and then they beat up and there's violence at the, how do you have a conversation when there's violence and violent words t thrown at each other? They're not the only ones, they're not the first ones. This happened, that's, this, this has happened historically. It is dangerous at this point. And, and you know who talks about this too is Angela Davis. Angela Davis talks about the, these kinds of um, 
the, the how we weaken each other by not having those conversations and about the kind of vicious attacks because we're different from each other. And 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 if we can't be if we can't deal with differences within our movement, then where if we then how do you deal with it? You try to deal with differences in your own homes, you know, let alone a larger community. So I think that that notion of differences and how we talk to each other and how we are to each other is criti as critical now as it was then, and perhaps even more so in this very difficult time that we're in. God, I feel like I'm preaching. <laughs> so no, I'm no, it's, that. no, it's it's. <laughs> It's all good, and, and and I would I would dare to say that anytime we're talking about social justices or injustices, a sermon is in order. <laughs> um, I have another question that you might not be able to answer, but I feel like maybe our viewers will be at some point, and I'm going to pose it since you were talking about terms and language. Um, we know that um, Zami is a pejorative right, that uh, described uh, Caribbean lesbian women, right, and, and, and Audre Lorde reclaimed that name, right. She said, Zami, a new spelling of my name. Queer has also been reclaimed and repurposed. And so, of course, I'm thinking of the N-word, right, and it's a long debate. It's been a long debate, but I'm just wondering, again, this may not be for you to answer, but if you want to, be brave enough to do so. I don't, I, I'm still wrapping my head around, too, uh, reclaiming and repurposing the N-word, especially for those people who believe the energy behind words give them meaning. The energy, you know, how can we, we, we reclaim queer? We, you know, Audre Lorde called herself Zami. And so I'm wondering about that N-word. Yeah, well, uh, again, I don't think I'm the person to answer that question, especially regarding the N-word. That, right. that is not mine to reclaim um, or repurpose. Um, well, what about queer? Because I do believe queer, our viewers can. Yeah. Yes, I can handle that one because. Okay. Um, because I see, see, I don't mind the word queer. I don't want it to erase lesbian. I don't okay. want it to erase feminist. And I find that um, it, it's taken a long time to be able to claim that word. Um, and. Um, now I'm trying to claim the word. Uh, I remember going to a poetry reading and described myself as an uh, an old. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a lesbian, an old les, an old feminist, and a lesbian widow. And people laughed because mm -hmm. how can a lesbian be a widow? Hmm. Okay. Right. So um, it's important for me to for every generation to claim whatever word they need to claim in order to move on and build a movement and keep going or whatever the hell they want to do, but not to kill the mother and the father, you know? Right. And so right. if we're, we're lesbians, I'm a lesbian. I love women. I love women. Okay. And I'm a feminist. My feminism informs my lesbianism. Not a lot of lesbians are feminists. You can find Republican lesbians, unfortunately. Okay, mm -hmm. so I claim what I am because I earned the right to say those words and to walk down the street and to be a lesbian. And um, I think the word queer is fine because it includes a lot of people, includes a lot of a lot of you know queer non-gender. I think that's really great. I just don't want it to erase a history a movement that dared to be out there, hold someone's hand, you know, say what they were, afraid that their children were gonna be taken away, that they were gonna lose their jobs. You know, mm -hmm. I had those experiences on every single job that I was on, okay? And queer is comfortable, more comfortable, more inclusive, but lured a lesbian, <laughs> To have it be a word that people are, 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 are saying in a negative way without pride is very painful to me. It's very, very painful to me. So I, I don't mind, people have to claim the words in their generations to keep them going, to make them what they want to be in their visions of, a, but don't kill off the mother and the father, you know? Right, right. And there's a lot of gay guys who can't stand that word queer, it's so painful for them. 
and at least to appreciate that history to understand, which is like the N word. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, it, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. You use it, you don't use it, be, but be aware of the history and the struggle to claim it, name it, to corrupt it, to use it, to, you know, whatever you want to do, it is, it, it, it's complicated, but you can't erase the histories that are involved in that or the people who claim those names at times when it meant their lives. Right. You know. Right. right. I received that. So I, I, I want to move towards, um, back to the beginning of the film, because I think it's important that we have a, a small conversation about um, the white women who were upset about not being let into the conference. But more than that, because I think the interviews explained how that operated. What I found interesting is that the first visualized interview that we saw on your screen, on your film, was what looked like a white man talking about Audrey Lord. And I said, how he opening this up? How's this white man opening this up? So I want to know what was, why? Well, first of all, he's disabled he's in a wheelchair. That's the first thing. He's a disabled okay. man. Okay. And he, was, he was, I think he was being open and humble, that he knew that he had to learn something. He wasn't pontificating. He wasn't, he was there to learn and he was being open. And so the contrast <laughs> was what I was kind of going for. It was like, okay. wait a minute. Why is this guy, how is he, he came there to learn. He came there to be part of, but also to learn. And that was, he was speaking so, he was seeking so personally. Um, and so it was an invitation for people, all kinds of people. I think it, it felt to me like he was bearing his soul to me and it, it felt, it felt, and also that we're, that we had somebody who was disabled right there, too. Um, you know, he wasn't the tall white guy with the whatever. He was in the chair, but that he was powerful and strong mm -hmm. and courageous. Um, so I, I just thought that it was an invitation um, okay. to the viewer. Okay. What about Pat Parker? So there's an image of the pamphlet. And the image went by very quickly, but slow enough for me to read a tribute to Pat Parker. And so I wanted to know, was that Audre Lorde's desire? Because I know Audre Lorde's desire was to ensure that 50% of the participants were women or um, working class women, black women or working class women. And so I wondered, since Pat Parker had died a year prior of cancer, was the tribute something that uh, Audre Lorde asked? And even so, or if not, uh, why not include it, some image or something about Pat Parker? Because I know they had a, a, a friendship. I believe Audre Lorde was Pat Parker's mentor or something in some ways. They became, they became friends through letter writing or some, some, some way they became friends. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. I just, it just stood out to me. Not, not really, but remember the, the conference organizers, both Jackie and Angela, you know, they were the ones to, and I know that there were things that, that Audrey um, asked them to do. I don't know what those things are, but I know okay. that that what, what she found was important. I remember that just now as we're talking, but they were the ones to organize the conference. And so in terms of, you know, the only thing the, uh, I was a, I was a helper. I, I helped to organize the, 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 blueberry, the blueberry Hill song with Blackberry. Yeah. I organized mm -hmm. that. Okay. And um, that was my, that was my, my cultural contribution, but the rest of it, I was just supporting in any way I can. I did a lot, a lot of the media stuff and the, you know, the, the design for the posters and all that kind of stuff. But I don't, in terms of the concrete cultural contributions and choices between Audrey and Angela and Jackie, I really, I don't know what that was about, you know, though that was, that was their decisions. Okay, so what about the quilt? Was that on the organizers too? Because I noticed you focused yes. on that quilt. Oh, yes, that was definitely Jackie. That was Jackie Alexander. She knew the women. She knew the women who designed the quilt. And that was Jackie that, that, that made that happen. Made okay, so was that the reason? So you showed the quilt several times in the documentary. Why? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, why did I show it? Why did I show the quilt? <sighs> Well, I think the quilt has such tremendous uh, meaning in the in the African community, um, and um, 
the women that did it, they did it for Audre Lorde. They didn't, they, I mean, we paid them with, with more, whatever money we had, but they did it for Audre Lorde. Okay. And, and I think that the quilt is significant because we are a quilt of many colors, you know, I mean, it just carries history with it. Um, yeah, there were two major things that were made, which is, I mean, that was a huge quilt, huge mm -hmm. quilt. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know how they, that story of that quilt, that's a, that's a question for Jackie Alexander. I mean, that would be a wonderful question. I didn't even think about asking all of that stuff. Well, I couldn't have put it in anyway. Anyhow, <laughs> and then the robe that Audrey Lord had, Angela, Angela commissioned that robe. Yeah, that was explained. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. right. So between the two of them, you see what I'm saying? The, between the two, it was like, oh my God, the, the, the brilliant, you know, ideas that came, those visual things, like all that color, all mm -hmm. that, all that work you know, uh, uh, you know, for her that came, came at her through those two images with the quilt and the, and the robe was phenomenal. So I, I just, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the originator of those ideas. I'm just the person who documented and appreciated the magnificence of those efforts. Right. And, and I, I think after the interview, as you ponder some of these questions a little further, because I didn't give them to you in advance, perhaps you will have more response about the quilt because um, the quilt is important to um, Black women's survival, right? As Audre Lorde discusses this importance of creativity, right? Um, we, we have to create in order to get over. And so I hope that as you contemplate these questions, you have more, because there's a reason why you focused on those quilts, whether you can conjure up the reason or not. I, and I'm, I'm very interested in hearing it. Um, I also noticed too, between the quilt and the robe, they're both purple. Do you know if that was intentional? I don't know, but I'm glad that it was. <laughs> okay. All right. So again, you know, I'm not an expert, but I'm just, I'm looking with this rhetorical eye of mine. That, that's good. No, I mean, I okay. like, like the way your mind works and, you know, it gives us a little Brillo pad to work against each other. So it's cool. Okay. All right. So I have, I have another question about um, some of your inclusions here. So you produced this film in 2002, which mainly archives a 1990 conference, right? Yet when Audre Lorde discusses the acquittal of a police officer who murdered another black body to which Lorde had to write a poem in an effort not to kill the first white person she saw, viewers saw protest images of Amadou Diallo, who in 1999 was shot 41 times and killed by four police officers. But Rodney King was brutalized by LA officers in 1991. What message of any did you intend to send your viewers by sharing protest footage from a 1999 protest versus the 1991 LA riots? That's a very good question. Um, I think maybe, uh, I think that Amadou Diallo at that point, because it was a 99, was probably stronger in my mind because of the okay. timing, you know, by the time that I was making the film, um, maybe that was, you know, that that was so, um, it, you know, it was just so strong in my mind. Um, I think that that's what it was, so. Okay. Because as I was contemplating the question, I, I, every question I wrote, I wondered what your answer might be. And I thought your answer might be that it expresses how the beat went on. Here you have Audre Lorde, 1990, saying, you know, I'm, I need to write this poem because this man was uh, acquitted. And then we got all the way to 1999, seven years after her passing, and this brother was shot 41 times. The beat goes on. Right. Right. Yeah. Here we are in 2021. The beat goes on. Yeah, right. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. So it was yeah. symbolic, but I, I, it, it's too far in my past to remember that particular mm -hmm. decision. But you got the point, um, you know, whatever, however it was used. So I, I hope that was um, that was conveyed. I can't even remember it at this point. Okay. So I have two more questions because I think I've gone over uh, Mary Ann's 30, 45 minute interview a lot. Oh, oh time. absolutely. <laughs> we've, been, we've, we've been going for months. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and viewers don't know it was three months before we even start recording. So there's that. Okay, so. <laughs> all right, so this my, I have two more questions. Audre Lorde died of cancer. Yes. So did June Jordan. Yep. Lucille Clifton. Yep. Margaret Walker. Yep. Tony K. Bambara. Yep. And Lorraine Hansberry. Yep. Nikki Giovanni is currently living with lung cancer. And James Baldwin said about Lorraine Hansberry, who died at 34 of pancreatic cancer, it is not far fetched to suspect that what she saw contributed to the strain which killed her. 
for the effort to which Lorraine was dedicated is more than enough to kill a man. Did Audre Lorde die from racism, classism, and sexism? Did she die of those pandemics to which there has been no cure? Or did she live to spite them? I think the answer is in your question. I really think the answer is in your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, Angela died of, uh, you know, she, she, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, when she was um, exactly my age. Um, and um, so I was surprised she lived as long as she did, you know, because she had so much love in her heart and so much love that she shared, but the shit that she experienced you know, especially within the academy, um, was, you know, painful, painful stuff. Um, and she had so much on her shoulders, so much responsibility on her shoulders. Um, and it, 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 it's hard to um, not count the kind of you know, harm to the body, you know, that racism is. It's harmful to the body, no matter how you rise, you know, no matter how much you love, no matter how much you give, there is an internal battle. And, you know, I mean, it, you get battle fatigue, you know, uh, I mean, look how many people from who've been in wars, the veterans who are killing themselves these days. Mm -hmm. you know because a, a lack of value that's placed on their lives and the shit that they have to go through humiliations and everything else degradation after they've given their lives in a certain kind of battle well she was in a battle too so was audrey lord so was tony Cade. so all of them were in a battle to do their art and to live in a in a racist society it's a very sick 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 sickness you know, and I, you know, I mean, it's not like we, we don't bring it on ourselves, but it certainly contributes, I think, to any, only, any of our illnesses that we have, you know. Um, what it would be like to live in a society where the kind of hatred that is that we get and see every day didn't exist. Can you even imagine it? I can't. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question. It's been 19 years since you directed, wrote, and produced The Edge of Each Other's Battle, the vision of Audre Lorde. What would you do differently? Um, oh, wow. What would I have done differently? Well, I would have liked to have had better cameras. <laughs> Holy crap, you know, lighting and cameras and, you know, I would have really liked to have had that, you know, really have, you know, much better equipment and stuff like that and given everybody really good cameras so that, you know, the sound and the quality was really, was really great. Um, but really that we got it done at all is a kind of a miracle, you know, and, you know, it, it should be seen in that light you know, this grassroots organization with no money, none, people borrowing cameras and <laughs> lights and whoever was there to volunteer who may have had, you know, two weeks experience, some had one year experience. I mean, you know, it's a miracle that it, it, that it exists. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to say that, um, and I love Jean Weisinger's photos. Thank God for Jean Weisinger because she took these magnificent photos. And there were other people who took great photos. Um, but it was that Jean Weisinger photo that we have of her with her arms up in the air from mm -hmm. that conference. That's Jean Weisinger's photos. She was there. Mm -hmm. And she took those photos. So, you know, it's just, a, it's a miracle to me that that thing exists. Um, and I, I really can't second guess myself because I did the best I could, you know, with the, with the information I had and, you know, with the skills that I had and the no money that I had, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, honey, 
I'm yeah. glad it's here. And so am I to be able to see that it's being played now, you know, in 2021 and being interviewed by this young Professor Kendra Bryant, <laughs> who's right. got a lot of questions <laughs> and curiosity. Right. It's a thrill for me. It's a total, absolute Valentine gift for me. It really is. It really is. I'm, I'm just so grateful that you that you think so much of the film to think about the questions and to have me standing in front of you and sharing, you know, some of what I've been able to live, you know, right. Well, absolutely. Life. And, and, have, you know, and, and, and Tony Morrison tells us in beloved, it is, it is a, it is a thing not to be passed on. And trust me when I say as a teacher at North Carolina a &T, my students will see your documentary. They will know Audrey Lord. And I am pretty sure that Audrey Lord will agree with what you said earlier that you found your job and you did it. You found your work and you did it and you did it well. And we all appreciate you and I appreciate you. And I just hope that um, as I train the next generation of scholars, they continue to pass on your genius as well as Audrey Lord's and yours, Mary Ann. So I thank you both for this opportunity to share this space. L'chaim. L'chaim. Cheers. Thank you very much, really.